This will be a quick demo of how to set up a risograph montage using the um, risograph action um, that will be linked in the description here. Um, and at the, this should be about five minutes, but at the end I'll make a brief explanation of how the risograph action works, which is which is pretty straightforward. Um, so here we have. Uh, scan of a piece of paper, which I want to use as my background. It's good to have some sort of paper base as your background. You can pull it off images, off an image search. You can take a photograph of a piece of paper, scan a piece of paper. In this case, I've just scanned a little piece of paper and I've got my background to work with here. And aside from that, I've opened all the um, files that we'll be using now into Photoshop. So the first thing I'm going to do is just quickly look through and make sure that our files have been masked and set to smart objects. So I can see, um, see sees at the bottom of this frame, and when I double click on a smart object, I can see that the mask is in there. Um, um, I now click on Window and Arrange and Tile All Vertically. So all the files are tiled across the screen. And now I'll simply take each of these pictures for each frame, I'll just click on the frame and then drag the smart object into the image. And some of these have mismatched color profiles. Um, I'm not going to worry about it for now. All right, so now that those images are in, I'm just going to go ahead and close everything except the montage. Now we've got all our subjects here, and we can go ahead and just position them a little bit so we can see where everyone is. This isn't our final composition, it's just to get it organized. And if you're having trouble that you can't click on the subjects and drag them, that probably means that the Move tool has Auto Select disabled, so you want to go ahead and enable that so you can drag things around. Now that your images are in place, um, such that you can see them all, um, we're ready to apply the action. Uh, to do that, we go to the window menu and select actions, which will open your action palette. Um, of course, you can quickly access it if you know where it's located, but because the interface is flexible, we're just doing it through the menu. Um, and here I've got my default actions and some other actions that I've made. So you can download the Rizzo action set, um, even though there's only one action in the set, um, through a link in this discussion, or perhaps I've sent it to you. Um, so what you'll do is you'll go to Load Actions. Um, in this case, Rizzo is right here in my Creative Cloud files. If you've downloaded it from the link, it'll be in your download folder. So you just click that and open, and there it is. Um, and now for each subject, uh, we select the action, which is inside the folder. So it's Rizzo and then Rizzo Graph. So for each of our um, smart objects, we just hit Play. So there's one, two, three, four, five. So each of these is set as a stack of adjustments and filters, um, which will allow you to tweak the image a little bit if you need to. Um, so for example, um, for this image here, um, I can double click. We've got hue saturation, filter gallery, curves. So at the bottom of the stack, I'll double click on curves. And you'll see that once the curves are opened, the image just looks like the original photograph again, which is fine. That's just so we can see what we're doing because this is at the bottom of the stack. So I can see with this image that um, we've got some blank space in the shadows, which is fine for this, but we don't really want so much blank space on the histogram in the highlights. So I'll just take this arrow here and drag it forward, and you'll see that makes a pretty big difference in terms of brightening the image up. Um, I'll do the same thing to this one. Slide that to where things start. Hit OK, and you can see if I double click on there again, because it's a smart object, it doesn't change my histogram, it just remembers the position. It's, it's almost the same as an adjustment layer. Um, check with this image. 
So we've got our images. The next thing you might be wondering is, what if I don't want these all to be the same color? Um, so that's a great point, and that is built in. So I'll click on this one here, and the top um, adjustment in this stack is hue saturation. And I can just double click on that, and then I can slide this hue around to set this to whatever color I want. Now, if I want to change the saturation, I can of course do that. I don't want to change all of these right now. I'll turn, I'll turn this one green. Let's maybe take down the saturation. There we go. So there we've got some inks going on. Now, all of these as part of the action are set to multiply. So you'll see if I move um, Harold around, it's like he overprints on whatever he goes over. So here we have the same subject in two different positions, and you start to get that multi-channel, um, whoops, I need to just select these two. You start to get that multi-channel printing effect where inks will kind of mix with each other if they print over each other. Something else you might want to play with, I'm gonna resize this. Notice with smart objects, while I resize, it turns into a normal picture, and then when I hit enter, all the adjustments reapply. So maybe with this one, um, I'll hit copy paste, put another one right in the same place, change the color on that to, I don't know, that bluish purpley color, and then I'll zoom in and offset it a little bit so you can get that effect too, where two channels have kind of misprinted. Um, so lots of possibilities here. Now, one of the benefits of having this set as a smart object, I know I keep saying one of the benefits, there's just so many benefits, is that the halftone pattern, which I'll zoom in so you can see, um, will not actually resize. So notice all these pictures have been resized in different ways, um, and we can see that the halftone grains are the same size. So I can resize this one again, make it a little bigger, and again, those points just regenerate and stay the same size. So that's the benefit of keeping all these adjustments inside the stack. Um, a lot of these masking artifacts, I think when you use this effect, kind of become irrelevant. Like I don't think that this um, issue on the hair here is really distracting. Even on this image here, less so, but just a refresher, because this is a smart object, all we have to do is double click on the image in the layer, and then we can click on the mask and adjust it with our method of choice. I'm just using a brush to tweak it, and then save, not save as, just save, close, and that artifact is gone here too. Um, so that's it, that's how you do this. So if you just wanna use the action, you can stop, you've done it. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go over how um, this works um, and how we make the action. Um, so for starters, I'm just gonna set my foreground and background to random colors, assuming that your image could be set in any way. So here I've got a picture of my son and I, and I will convert that into a smart object. It should have been a smart object already. Um, and now I will begin. So if I look through the action here, um, I can see that the order of operations was first to um, reset the swatches, set the foreground color, put a blank curve adjustment, set the filters, set hue saturation, and then set the layer to multiply. So I'm gonna go through all that um, and show how you would make that as a new action. So in the action tab, we go to this little menu, new action, um, and we'll call it demo. And the way actions work is you hit this little record button while you're recording the action. When you're done working, you hit stop, and then when you wanna do it, you hit play, and it will um, implement that action onto whatever you're working with. So the first part of my action, now that we're recording, is I just click on this little black and white thing here to reset the swatches. The reason I like to do that is any action that starts with any sort of selective color adjustment, it's a good idea to 
um, reset the swatches at the beginning of the action because you don't know what the file is going to be like to start with. So now that that is reset, um, the next st stage was to set the foreground color. Um, so I just take black and I drag this red um, slider thing all the way to the top, which gives me pure red. I pull this all the way to the side, which gives me pure magenta. I can also just put in the RGB values of, you know, full red, 255, zero green, full blue. Um, the next thing I want to do is put the first adjustment. So the stack of adjustments inside the object, the smart object, should be curves, then the filter, then hue saturation. If I can say it, hue saturation. So I go to image adjustments and curves. Now I don't do an adjustment layer. I just do an adjustment because I want it to be inside the object. So. I don't really see any adjustments to make here, um, but even if I did, I would leave it alone because the point here is just to put in a blank curve adjustment that can be manipulated in the future. Um, the next thing we do is we implement the filter, and that's where these colors we selected will actually matter. So here I go to Filter Gallery. There's lots of stuff in here. Most of the stuff in the Filter Gallery are really simple filters. Um, from really early versions of Photoshop. Um, here in size, we got artistic, brush, blah, blah, blah. Um, inside sketch, we have halftone pattern. This isn't the only way to make a halftone pattern in Photoshop, but this method actually does look the most like a risograph print, which I looked at before throwing this together. So here we can change the size of the dots. I'll set it back to two because I like that. We can change the contrast. Again, I'll just leave it at a low contrast. And then you can also set the pattern type. So you can have like a striped halftone pattern or a circular halftone pattern. Um, I just went with settings that looked most like a risograph. These are within the object, so you can tweak it again in the future. So just click OK. Um, we're almost done. Um, now we want to put another adjustment. Again, not a layer, an adjustment. Um, into the sex, we go to image, adjust, hue, saturation, and I think if we shift it by 50 points, it'll get us to the next um, sort of primary color. So for magenta, if we go plus 50, that should get us to about red or to exactly red. So that's fine. I just picked red because I thought it was a good color, starting color. It's easy to look at, um, but you can the point is that this is adjustable. So I hit OK. And now the biggest problem here is that everything is opaque. You can see all this um, white between the dots is blocking the image behind it. So the last stage of the action is we have not, by the way, selected any other layers, which is important. We just stay on the layer, we'll, the layer that we're working on. Um, the last part of the action is we go to the um, blend mode and we set that to multiply. Um, multiply sets white as zero and black as opaque. Um, and now that that's done, we don't wanna move this around to adjust it. We just hit stop. And now if we take another image, we can use that and it'll just play the whole thing like we saw earlier.